I really do feel like this tour was a part of the emancipation of Mimi, if that's what, you know, people were kind of referring to it as my emancipation as an artist, um, and definitely as a touring artist, because, you know, on different tours that I'd gone on in the past, I'd never spent as much time on the road. I definitely never traveled the way I traveled on a tour bus or been so much a part of a tour from beginning to end. I think that this did begin something that I'd like to continue for the rest of my life because I do love meeting my fans, performing for my fans. It's a little bit difficult for me because when I go out on stage, um, it takes a lot of preparation in terms of just resting time and um, really treating my voice like an instrument. So that's difficult for me. But that's just because it's hard for anybody not to speak for 24 hours. But I did the best I could and um, I had a good time. So packed up my Louis Vuitton, jumped in your ride and took off. You'll never ever find a girl who loves you more than me. We went through a whole group of ideas for the set design for the Avengers of Mimi tour. We were given a brief um, from Mariah, talked about some of the elements she wanted, and uh, Benny Medina talked to us about the, what the tour meant to them and what they were trying to portray, the emancipation of Mimi in particular. I mean, there's one idea that I love that I still think I may use for my next tour, so I'm not gonna discuss that right now. But um, where we ended up with the set was what ended up being a huge M. We started originally about five or six months out from the first tour date. These were the original sketches showing the uh, two stages here and a third stage out in the house. And that idea developed. The first thing we changed was the uh, proscenium header. We went through a couple of different developments on that, one with some butterflies. And then uh, Mariah came with the concept that we should use her initial M. The M was actually my idea and I wanted it to be something that you could project on or you could just see, you know, imagery on. You know, it was really important because of how big the places, the arenas or the stadiums or wherever we were playing were. When Mariah suggested that we use the M, uh, it just seemed natural for me to, to fill it with the uh, LED modules so that we could get many different looks out of, out of one set piece. We went as far as rendering, uh, set renderings for each song in the show so that before we got to rehearsal, we were all in agreement on the path for that song, the look, the vibe for that song. For me, the screens were very important because the venues were really large and I wanted the crowds to feel the excitement of a large venue, but also the intimacy of being like up close and personal with me. So it was important for me that the fans felt a strong connection to me. And I think that the screens and the M all being sort of this visual kind of link to the people in the way, way back, you know, back of the arena. That's something where, you know, you you still feel like you're part of a big event, but you're still at least, you know, you're close to the person up on stage. Each song had specific meaning, specific direction, and, uh, and there were some details that uh, took us a while to get uh, to understand, but yeah, Mariah's very, specific about a lot of those ideas. One of my favorite things about this tour was being able to do something I've always wanted to do, which is have a second stage and surprise people by showing up in the middle of the crowd. Not that it's something that's never been done, but it's something that I had never been able to do. Um, it's not easy to do. You know, a lot of people try to tell me, don't do that, you know, it's too expensive and whatever. And the truth is that it is, but you know what? I know that the fans appreciated it. It's just nice for people to, you know, you know, everybody can't be up front, you know? So it's nice to be able to play to a whole nother section of people and, and be surrounded by a whole nother section of people. And it was really important to me to try and surprise the fans. I mean, obviously I know that once you do your first show, the fans basically know what you're gonna do, uh, unless you change the whole thing every night. But, um, you know, that was, that was fun. I, I had a good time. Hi, Honeybee Fly, this is Rachel. 
how are you guys? I hope you guys are doing good. I hope you guys are ready for the tour. Mimi's adventure. You know, Mimi, Mimi, go way back. Rachel is a really good friend of mine. She is a co-choreographer and she also is a dancer and she is a really fun person and we definitely have laughs on stage. So I'm a dancer. I'm the other half of Rachel and um, I'm really excited to be here. Everybody's amazing and we have such a cool time. And um, there's nowhere else I'd rather be. We're really charged after the show. We get like, we get on the bus. All right, so we're on the dancer's bus. It's not bleak. She goes to her nice little cute little automatic princess bus, pink yet lavender. And she's just like saying, you know, like really zen music going on. No, I'm joking, she doesn't do that. She listens to rap music all night. The fun place to be is really the dancer's um, bus. And that's not the healthy place for the singer to be. <laughs> Now, the dancers always have a stone groove on their bus. I can't endorse nothing. My name is uh, Brian Tanaka. Let me introduce you to a good friend of mine. It's Eddie Morales right here. They call me Goof. As you can see, I got some jokes, but my real name is Russell Lee Wright. KC, M-O, you know what I'm saying? But um, that's what's up. So I'm totally enjoying myself. I'm with a legend, and that feels wonderful. That was a nice adventure of Mimi. Yeah, we've got the hottest singer on the planet. She's made one of the dopest records ever. She's sold 175 million copies. We need to have a hot, sexy, good-looking, unbelievable band. I mean, there are some musicians I've worked with before, like Eric Daniels, who plays keyboards. He's a really nice guy. It's Trey Lorenz back now. You got the real Trey here. I've known Trey the longest out of anybody. We out here on the Adventures of Mimi tour. We're having a wonderful time. Mariah's been putting her thing down. She's doing all the hits. We met when I was making my first record, my first album, and um, we've been friends ever since. And he's one of those really fun people that People tend to just latch on to him because he's like a party on legs. He's just a funny guy and he's extremely talented. I really think he's got a lot of versatility in terms of his um, his vocals, his range. Hey honeys that be fly, I would be Sherry, AKA the Mae West of Brooklyn. Definitely having Sherry, who I like to call the Mae West of Brooklyn. Yeah, and don't tell nobody, but I'm Mariah's favorite. She is too much for words. <laughs> I mean, I think when she did her, I think when she did her interview for the DVD, she showed a little bit of her personality. Everybody knows Marianne is my auntie. And Marianne's been singing with Mariah maybe uh, about 10 years, I do believe. And yeah, she talks about me all the time. She gets on stage, she shows her personality a little bit more. Um, and Marianne is quite saucy as well. I'm Marianne Tatum, AKA Tots, AKA Tatum Tots, Tippity Tots. And this is my child, Tiffany Soraya Snowflake Tatum. Having Marianne with me is really like having a sister there who is just someone that I can always count on. Every time we work together is something new. I've learned a lot from her and I'm very grateful for the opportunity. I know that there are millions of people that would love to do what I do. And so I take my job very seriously. At the end of the day, I love MC. Marianne is a perfectionist like myself and she's one person who I would trust to go into the studio without me and say, I want a background vocal part that's like this and sing it to her. And I know she'll call me 20 times until it's the exact way that I want. We have a good time on stage. All the singers are funny. They all have jokes. Like, they're all cracking jokes the whole time. That's why sometimes I can't even make it through the song. Especially I'll be there. Because when Trey is standing there, you know, you never know if he's gonna poke me in the side or what, whatever. People always be like, why do you guys laugh? It got so bad to the point we couldn't even practically do the song anymore because <laughs> we would just be laughing at each other. What's up, Anaheim? I go by the name of the young king, DJ Sus One. All my sexy ladies make some noise real loud. We had DJ Sus One who's become like, you know, just 
someone that I really have found to be a lot of fun. We have a lot of things in common and we would be doing practical jokes and stuff, but, you know, behind the scenes on the tour. Basically what I do on this tour is I'm the DJ for Mariah, I do a few scratches on a few of her records. And then when she goes backstage and does her thing to get ready for the next song, I have to hype the crowd up. Get out your seat, please! That's how I do it. <laughs> Everybody who I'm out on the road with has their own rehearsal time. The dancers will be there all day working out their parts and then, you know, I'll just come in at the end for like, you know, where am I going on stage at this moment or what's, you know, a little bit of choreography here and there. In a perfect world, I would rather have more rehearsal time. Benny put these meetings in after each rehearsal just to go over everyone's tasks and everyone's jobs and just to try and keep the train on the road and moving really fast down the track. So it was very smart of him because, you know, when you have a tour of this magnitude, this size, you have so many moving parts that you just need to make sure that the parts are all moving correctly in a timely manner together. So big props to him for that. You know, you can rehearse something until you're blue in the face and that doesn't mean you're gonna do it perfectly every night. We've seen people who clearly are consummate professionals have like, really disastrous moments on stage that nobody could have really helped or prevented. It's just what, you know, you gotta, like they say, the show must go on, so you deal with it. One time I came up on the lift, and this is nobody's fault, really, but the lift was about this far away from where it needed to be, but I still had to somehow get off of that thing. I had a few really difficult moments, even just like with, you know, malfunctions that were nobody's fault, but like one time, a shirt popped open and I had to continue singing and hold the top of the shirt while making sure that, you know, everything didn't kind of pop out all over for the world to see. I decided to wear pasties. I'd flash you, but you never know what can happen with that. So I wear pasties now because I was singing fantasy and all of a sudden the top was like, shh, pow, but it didn't go pow. I held it together like a trooper because the show must go on. Yes. I'm just meditating on the, um, the set list right now. Sorry, it'll be boring. That's what I do best. We've got to go. All right, we're moving. You know, it's a really difficult process just to decide what the songs are going to be that I sing on stage just to make the set list. I've always liked to know what my fans like to hear live. It was really tough to make the selection because we go through it all the time. I mean, there are still songs that we haven't yet put back in the set that we used to have in the set years ago. Uh, you know, I love Vanishing. I, you know, there's just so many songs. And I think, you know, we based the set on also logistics, as I said, you know, there was a B stage where she was entering, on which ramp, you know, it's, you have to coordinate it all. I really enjoyed starting the whole show with It's Like That, being that it was technically the first single from The Emancipation of Mimi, which started the emancipation thing and started the adventures and that whole thing, but I really enjoyed it. I mean, it was like a whole different, you know, a whole different sensation. Baby, I I used to open the show with Heartbreaker, but this time around it was my second um, song. And it's funny because I can't ever decide between um, the two versions. There's one version with Jay-Z and one version that had Brat and Missy on it. Um, I loved both videos and both, both versions of the song. And it was really incredible to be able to have Brat come out and then at Madison Square Garden to have Jay-Z come out and the place just went wild. And that was like one of my most fun moments and so that was a really cool thing for my fans. Come on. Come on. I wanted to start the show off, you know, feeling fresh and new and not, you know, okay, she's gonna do the typical same old, same old set list but you know some things work really well back to back and you know some things it's okay to experiment with like certain songs like dream lover this time around 
I really, and I think the fans really responded well to it as well. Um, I, I really wanted to do something different with um, with the sample because it's written, the, the original Dream Lover is written over a sample um, of a song called Blind Alley. So it's like, it's like a classic hip hop loop that most people don't even realize a song is written over. So it wasn't that much of a stretch to figure out what to do with it. Randy Jackson and, and myself and a couple different people sat down and came up with some different concepts and ideas and Dream Lover turned into the beat of Juicy. It was hot to me because it was nice to be able to take something that's like become one of my, I guess it's a classic song of mine now, if you could call it that, it's weird for me to say, but, um, and merge it with something that's really, you know, a classic in its own right, you know, and been done already like three times now and been a hit. My All is one of the more traditional ballads that I've done that I like to keep close to the way I did it initially. And yet, when it goes into that fast dance mix at the end, it doesn't seem out of the blue to people because I've been doing it that way for a long time. We tried this time to um, pip it up a little bit more and change it, you know, slightly musically and to, um, you know, do the background vocals a little bit differently. But it was kind of like the if it ain't broke, don't fix it type thing. one of those songs where, I mean, I'll never forget even recording that dance version, the fast version of that song. We did it in Australia when I was on tour um, during Butterfly. And that was a really quick tour, but um, hopefully next time I go out, I'll be able to go to Australia again, because I loved, loved, loved my time there. But that's why I recorded that, just one more night, that section that everybody sings when basically I go into the frenzy of the tornado of the backstage world and change clothes. But, um, you know, it's one of those songs that I'll always do. It's very nostalgic. And I think people like to hear that first ballad. They are kind of waiting for me to open up and sing that first big ballad. Treated me kind, sweet as the need. I feel like even if something like Vision of Love is a difficult song to sing in some ways. I still feel like I have more freedom to do whatever I want on that song because it is, I wrote it, you know, it's an older song at this point. It's the first song I ever put out. And so I changed the way I do that song and people aren't gonna be like, you know, confused or or um, angry at, at me, you know what I mean? That it was cool. Putting Vision of Love, which is a difficult song to sing, into Fly Like a Bird was a difficult thing, but musically, the two songs flow together. They were both spiritual songs, in, in my mind. I mean, a lot of people wouldn't think that about Vision of Love, but really that song is about God and about spirituality, as is Fly Like a Bird. And, you know, it was less, it was less overtly about that, you know, but it, it really always was about that to me. Bringing out the choir now, which means we're going to have a special moment. This next song is from the emancipation of Mimi. Doing Vision of Love and Fall Like a Bird back to back, even though it's so much appreciation from the audience there when they know how hard you're working. At a certain point, you really have to just let go and let God, and I had to just do that and let it be what it was going to be. It was just amazing, you know, that on this particular night that I was singing this song that, you know, Trey and I grew up singing together. I didn't even tell, I didn't even tell Trey, cause he, I don't know if he would've been able to get through the song, but to know that Mr. Barry Gordy was in the audience, the man who created Motown Records. Cause if she doesn't... I don't even, I don't want to know when there are legends in the audience like that, you know, because it's, it, um, it, it, it's very overwhelming. 
I had done something sort of similar to coming through the crowd like a prize fighter on the tour when I had my album Rainbow out, actually when Heartbreaker was the single. And I really liked doing that, but I didn't get to perform on a stage in the same way that this was. And stay out there, um, you know, for three songs and really connect with a different section of the audience, you know? Fantasy is always something fun to do, and it's a nice tribute, especially after losing ODB. You know, being able to have him up there on the screen is always nice, and people still saying his rhyme with him. The me and Mariah go back like babies with pacifiers. We'll never die. And um, then being out there for Don't Forget About Us was really, really a nice moment, because like I said, the fans really made that happen. It was a big, important, important moment for me. Thank you to all my fans. You have to really know in your heart that no matter what it is that you want, you'll get it. I really enjoyed the moment of like being in the dark with the fans and just having the lights that were on the ceiling and it created this kind of like special energy out there in the middle of, of all the people. So it was really cool. Remember us and and don't forget about it. And then Always Be My Baby is one of those songs that people have known for a long time. And that was Jermaine Dupri. We wrote Don't Forget About Us, which was my most recent number one, and Always Be My Baby together, which was the first song we ever wrote together. After singing three songs on that B stage, to come back and walk through the crowd while singing Always Be My Baby, which is fun because the crowd participates in that song, and um, I really enjoy those kinds of moments, walking through the crowd singing. There's something about that that's really, um, you know, you just become a part of the experience you have, that you share the experience of the night with the crowd. Um, but getting back there to do Honey was sometimes like, okay, I wish we had a little longer so I could do a costume change or something. But um, I think the crowd appreciated it that, that I didn't, you know, that we just kept going for a while. Honey's one of those songs that I'll always love performing. It's, it's, you know, I never expected to get the reaction that I guess, but people really, I guess it's a lot to do with the fact, I mean, for me, I, uh, that was a real transition in, in my life when I did the video for Honey. It's still my favorite video I've ever made. And um, I think a lot of my fans feel the same way. If you simply happen to be there, I get the only one who makes me come one back in the day when like Diana Ross or Aretha Franklin would just decide to talk on a record for like however long. And that was the, the hottest part of it because it would just be like, you know, them doing whatever they wanted. And when I designed the vocal arrangement for the song, I Wish You Knew, that was my inspiration obviously. And I was definitely thinking of performing the song live. I don't know if anybody else out there tonight knows what it feels like. I just want somebody so bad that nothing and nobody can ever seem to fill that void. We were fortunate enough to capture um, a night where Boyz II Men and myself were in the same city at the same time, and it was kind of like this, the way that when we wrote the song together, you know, we just it was just random how we both had a similar idea and we came together, we wrote the song. That was sort of what this performance was like, you know. They they just showed up without, you know, wardrobe or anything else or rehearsal or anything. And that really, to me, shows, like, the consummate professionals that they are. Sorry, I never told you The fans really appreciated it so much to see that song because so many people have a close attachment to One Sweet Day. So uh, it was so nice to see them and you could really, when I watch the video, I really see how much, you know, I, I miss singing with them and miss seeing them and it was, um, it was a really nice moment for me. There's a hero If you look inside your heart I know that if I don't sing hero, it's like, 
kind of a problem in terms of certain people who are just coming there to hear the song Hero. And it's funny because I wrote the song and I didn't even write it for myself. And I ended up singing it and it became like one of my biggest songs ever. Um, and coming back and, and, and singing that song after even just going through so much in my life as a human being, not a performer or whatever, just, you know, people watching my struggle, going through their own struggles, you know, singing that song and having people sing it back to me still really means a lot to me, regardless of the fact that I always said, you know, okay, when I first wrote it, I was like, this song is a little bit corny, you know, whatever. The point is a lot of people have come up to me and said, thank you for saving my life with this song. That song was also one of those songs that many people have said to me, this song motivated me when I was going through a really tough time. And someone that I just worked with, Lee Daniels, said that that song got him through making a couple movies that he never thought he'd get through making and, you know, just like for an, on a really like shoestring budget. And just, I'm only bringing this up because he happened to inspire me to, to do a different version of the song that I hadn't heard in a long time, the remix of, of that song. And um, so, you know, sometimes it's like you throw a new song and you throw an extra song in because you feel like that crowd is going to really appreciate it. Honestly, one of the most gratifying moments of the whole tour was always walking back out to sing We Belong Together. I didn't mean it when I said I didn't love you so I should have held on tight, I never should have let you go I didn't know nothing, I was stupid, I was foolish, I was lying to myself I really feel like the song We Belong Together, when you watch people sing along with it, there's couples that you know it's like their song, like just by the way they're holding each other while they sing the song. There's just girls that you like, feel like you're like watching yourself when you were growing up, going together to a concert, like singing their favorite song. It's one of those songs where I could just hold the microphone like this and the audience like sings back to me, you know, for throughout that whole song. But it's also very much a performance song. So, um, you know, having that be the encore was always my moment of like my get the chills moment because uh, it was just one of those it's one of those songs that kind of was a life-changing moment for me God bless you good night thank you so much I love the moment when these pink yet lavender butterflies rain down on all the people and it's this really magical moment and a lot of times I'll sing a little bit of, of Butterfly, the outro of the song and um, as I'm walking off I'll keep singing. It's something I once saw Patti LaBelle, or not once, almost every time I've seen her, she keeps singing until she's in the dressing room and I love that because it's like if she feels like singing she just keeps singing and that's kind of the way I do with, with Butterfly because it really is my signature song. Out of all the songs, it definitely is. It's really hard to summarize what I learned or experienced or felt most uh, out of this tour because it was like a roller coaster, like the metaphor that we used um, to begin the show. I think every Mariah tour is really, really different. I think the from the song list that we're doing to how she's doing it, to the stage design, to the look of the band, the sound of the band, the, you know, everything's different. The costumes, the wardrobe, everything's just completely different. I really did have a good time and there's, there's nothing like seeing my fans that up close and personal, especially with the tour bus, being there every night and the real devoted fans who would come there and have some things that were just really special to them that they had to give me. For me, connecting with the fans is everything because not everybody is about that. I've had people tell me you can't get so close to your fans, you shouldn't do that. Other entertainers have said that to me and I don't agree with that. 
What's your name? My fans come to the show to hear me sing, to hear the material, to hear songs that have been like the soundtrack to their lives. And it's like those songs have been the soundtrack to my life too, you know? And um, so we have an experience together. You know, Mariah's tenacity to give her fans everything just as bar none. She always gives it up, does everything she can to make sure that they're happy. I thank you so much. You're an angel up above. You helped me get through the pain that I lost my father, my relationship, everything I go through. I thank you for your music and your angel. I love you, Mariah. Yeah. The fans are the ones who get you going. My fans have been with me through every adventure in my career. And I think in the end, you know, I felt like it was important to document it. Whether or not, you know, everything was perfect didn't, doesn't really matter. It's about the fact that we all went on this journey together, me and my fans and my friends and the people who were, you know, a part of the tour, part of the experience. We all had an adventure together. If you don't take the risk, you may not experience the adventure. There was a rumor that Jack had his own bus. I mean, to me, my bus was Jack's bus because he just takes over wherever he likes. Right, these are bunks, and this will be the infamous nook of Jack. So he had his little nook that was designated for him, but sometimes he would stay on the bed, and you know, I love those moments because it's just really cute. And I have some really adorable pictures too of just like Jack hanging out, sleeping on the bed on the tour bus. Look at the boy. I can't even take it. I can't take it. I can't take how cute you are. I can't take how cute you are. I can't take how cute you are. Look, he's giving you love eye. Look at this. Look at this crazy action with his boy. <laughs> I love you. And he just sits there and just when lets I'm you like, do whatever you want. <laughs> He's like, whatever. He's like, as long as I have my little bear. Oh, yes, yeah, a puppy baby. Jack is like, he don't care. Mm. <laughs> <laughs>